Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Malaria is as persistent as it is old. Scientists found evidence of mosquito-carried malarial parasites preserved in amber from over 30 million years ago. From our beginnings on the African continent, humans have been afflicted by and attempted to treat malarial infection. It's only in the last 100 years that we've made any kind of significant headway with synthetic prophylactics and treatments. Today, 2.9% of the world population has malaria. According to the 2019 World Health Organization Malaria Report, there were 228 million cases in 2018, which was down from 251 million in 2010. In 2018, there were 405,000 deaths from malaria globally, with 67% of those deaths children under the age of 5. These are devastating figures as is every preventable death, but are also significantly lower than they were 20 years ago. In the 2005 report, the WHO estimated that there were 350 to 500 million new cases every year, and that at least 1 million people in Africa alone died annually from malaria. Jesus Christ, so many people. So many people. Uh, For centuries, the wealthy of malarial cities like Rome fled to cooler climes in the malaria season, and the poor suffered the fevers and the weaknesses of the parasitic infection. Doctors and healers prescribed herbal remedies like artemisia and belladonna, or ordered bloodletting, trepanning, or even amputations. In regions like sub-Saharan Africa, where the parasite thrived year-round, members of the population developed sickle cell anemia, a red blood cell mutation that protected the carrier from malaria while creating its own set of health challenges. The devastation of malaria kept European armies out of the interior of Africa for decades, as the Dutch, Portuguese, and English had no immunities to the parasite and its debilitating fevers. But when Italian priests accompanied Spanish invaders in Central America, bringing with them the malarial mosquitoes and introducing the disease to the Amazonian basin and Andean mountains, the Inca introduced the Europeans to a game-changing treatment which has been called quinaquina, cascaria, or most commonly today, cinchona. Quinine, the alkaline derived from the bark of the cinchona tree, would prove the most effective treatment for malarial fever and infection in human history, up until the mid-20th century. In the decades after the bark of the tree was exported to Europe, every state with imperialist aspirations wanted access to quinine. The Spanish crown, recognizing quina bark for its power and lucrativeness, monopolized the harvest and export of the medicament. By the beginning of the 19th century, the imperialist aspirations of Europeans required an effective malarial treatment. The quest for quinine led to a robust smuggling ring empowered by the age of revolutions, significant advances in the synthesis of organic compounds, the start of homeopathy, and the invention of the British Empire's cocktail of choice. Quinine's role in reshaping the world is almost immeasurable. I'm Avril Earls. And I'm Marissa Rhodes. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. Before we regale you with stories of drugs and disease, we have some very special people to thank. Our Patreon supporters keep the lights on and the microphones recording, and we're grateful for each and every one of you. We want to give a special shout out to our mega donors, our auger and excavator level patrons. Maddie, Denise, Colin, Edward, Susan, Christopher, Peggy, Maggie, Danielle, and Iris. Your generosity knows no bounds, and we are honored that you choose to support us. Listener, if you are not yet a patron of this show, it's easy. Just go to patreon.com backslash dig podcast to learn more. Malaria is caused by several species of the parasite Plasmodium, 
The parasites live in the salivary glands of mosquitoes, which then move into the bloodstream when a mosquito bites another organism. There are many strains of plasmodium, including strains that will attack rodents, birds, reptiles, and of course primates, including non-human primates. There are also several strains that will attack humans, uh, some worse than others. One, plasmodium falciparum, can be quickly fatal because it can produce blood clots in the brain. The most common symptom of malarial infection is intermittent fevers. The fevers come and go because they are associated with the life cycle of the plasmodium, although we don't, we still don't re really fully understand why the fevers are intermittent. But the plasmodium sets up shop in the liver, and as it releases its offspring into the bloodstream, the offspring enter, feed on, and destroy red blood cells. If the host recovers from the malarial fever, they will feel anemic because of the loss of red blood cells and listless. Without treatment, a host will continue to experience intermittent fever until so weakened that their organs fail and they die. The body, as our listening medical professionals know, needs its red blood cells to carry oxygen throughout the body. Without oxygen, we die. Well before the disease's true source was understood, the Romans called the plasmodium infection malaria, old Italian for bad air. Medieval Italians, following the logic of the miasma theory of disease, believed that malaria originated in the smell that emanated from the Campania and the city's swamps. Malaria existed seasonally in places like the Mediterranean. In some regions of Eurasia and Africa, the Congo, India, and other humid climes, malaria was a constant. The parasitic origins of the disease made it very hard to treat, and the victims of the worst strains of malaria died in droves. Some historians credit a particularly harsh malarial summer as the cause of the fall of the Roman Empire. Conversely, malaria was unknown in Central and South America until the European invaders arrived. In addition to blood-sucking stowaways in the European ships, any conquistadors who were infected with the plasmodium parasite could pass it to the native species of mosquitoes inhabiting the South American lowlands. The Quechua-speaking people of the Andean highlands had a very effective treatment for fevers. The quinaquina tree, which is generally translated as bark of barks in Quechua. Their healers, curanderos, collected the bark, dried it, and then crushed it into a powder to mix with water and ingest. Though they'd never encountered malarial fever before, the Quechua healers used the quina bark to treat those afflicted, and it proved just as effective. Side note, yes, these are the same curanderos that we talked about in my episode on the cunning folk. Healing arts in South, South America had spiritual and magical properties, just as they did in early modern ancient, etc., in modern Europe and America. When the European missionaries were traipsing around the Andean highlands in search of souls to save, they saw curandero knowledge and practice as the work of the devil, even as they recorded and benefited from curandero knowledge and practice with medicines. Mm. <laughs> um. There's a lot of that kind of hypocrisy going on in my episode about tobacco as well. Um, <laughs> while the curanderos had been using quina bark to treat fevers for decades, perhaps centuries before the Europeans invaded, they also had a range of fever-reducing herbs at their disposal. Historian Matthew Crawford suggests that it was the Andean medical cosmological precursors that had the curanderos applying quina bark to malarial fever shortly after the disease began afflicting indigenous peoples. We don't know when exactly malaria made its way to the Andean region, though it was most likely to have been in the first decade or so after Francisco Pizarro murdered Atahualpa, the last freestanding South American emperor in 1533. Though the curanderos may have dabbled in trial and error medical experimentation to find a cure for malarial fever, Crawford argues that their medical cosmology would have steered them towards Kinabark from the outset. According to Andean medical lore, organized around the hot-cold dichotomy, herbs harvested from cold regions were considered hot and vice versa. Kina bark was harvested from the Loja region, which was hot, so the bark was cold, the perfect remedy for fever. Some of the first Europeans to take note of the indigenous medicament were Jesuit priests who had been dispatched to the New World to collect souls and knowledge for the Catholic Church. 
The Society of Jesus, or Jesuits, is a religious order of Catholic priests that originated in Spain but had, by the 17th century, become a powerful tool for Roman Catholic power and reach around the world. Members of the order arrived in South America as early as 1559 and immediately went to work building schools and missions. As in Catholic regions of Europe, Jesuits served as advisors and teachers of the colonial elite and were able to move freely through the colonial world. Jesuit priests, including Bernabe de Cabo and Cardinal Juan de Lugo, are credited with introducing the bark to Europe around 1640. Because of their role in getting the bark into the hands of European botanists and healers, Kina bark was known widely by a range of Vatican-inspired nicknames, including the Sacred Bark, Jesuit's Bark, Cardinal's Powder, and Popish Powder. Ooh, the Popish Powder. Though the earliest accounts of the bark, like that of Nicholas Menardes, credited the Andean healers with its discovery and use, that credit would be worn down by the decades uh, and association with the Vatican. Though in the last 10 years, the narrative of quinine's discovery is being shifted back to indigenous medical knowledge, recent articles in Slate and the history section of Erasmus Bond, a tonic company, both acknowledge the Andean's use of the bark to treat fevers. There's also still medical journals that discuss Cinchona's discovery in the 17th century, centering the narrative of quinine firmly as a Eurocentric miracle cure. European taxonomer Carl Linnaeus helped along this myth by naming the tree Cinchona after a European countess who was allegedly treated with the Kina bark in 1638 when she came down with malarial fever. Several accounts, including that of British explorer Clements Markham, whom we will return to, reported that it was the countess who first brought the quantity of bark to Spain in 1640. According to Markham, writing in 1862, while the Countess Anna was suffering from fever in 1638, in her 63rd year, the corregidor of Loja, Don Juan López de Canizares, sent a parcel of powdered quina, quina bark to her physician, Juan de Vega, who was also captain of the armory, assuring him that it was a sovereign and never-failing remedy for Tertiana, which is uh, intermittent th fevers that appear in like threefold every three or, months or, or something every three months or weeks or something like that it was administered to the countess and effected a complete cure the count of cinchon returned to spain in 1640 and his countess bringing with her a quantity of the healing bark was thus the first person to introduce this invaluable medicine into europe hence it was sometimes called countess's bark or countess's powder her physician, Juan de Vega, sold it at Seville for 100 reals the pound. In memory of this service, Linnaeus named the genus which yields it Chinchona, and afterwards the lady Anna's name was still further immortalized in the great family of Chinchonaceae. By modern writers, the first H has been usually dropped, and the word is now most invariably, but most erroneously, spelled Chinchona. After the cure of the Countess of Chinchon, the... Jesuits were the great promoters of the introduction of bark into Europe. In 1639, as the last act of his vice royalty, her husband did good service to the cause of geographical discovery by causing the expedition under the Portuguese Tejera to proceed from Quito to the mouth of the Amazons, accompanied by the Jesuit Acuna, who wrote a most valuable account of the voyage. That reminds me a lot of the story of vaccination, how, like, I think it's Lady... Mary Wortley Montague or oh, something yeah. mm -hmm. like she went to the Ottoman Empire and was like hey I found this vaccination thing and then the story becomes about like her giving it to her kids and her lobbying the like British Parliament to like I don't know mandate it or whatever right um but like very few people talk about like who she got it from mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah Exactly. Through brutal conquest, the Spanish crown controlled most of South America by 1600. It was only through local knowledge that the secrets of the fever tree were accessible. The useful varieties of the tree were native to the Andean region of the former Incan Empire, which the Spanish conquered in 1534. The Quechua-speaking people knew where the trees grew, how to identify them, and how to harvest the bark, and how to use it as a medicine. As early as 1571, Spanish physician Nicolas Monardes discussed an Indian remedy derived from a tree bark in the Loja region in his medical treatise. Historians agree that this was quina bark, 
Crawford also points out that the Andean medical theory, a system that involved balance between hot and cold in the body, as well as in state and divine matters, would have been particularly familiar to the Europeans who operated within the Galenic humoral uh, model of medicine and disease. This may explain why Europeans were comfortable adopting so many Andean and other indigenous herbal remedies so quickly. However, because the powdered bark had a particularly bitter flavor, under the European medical cosmology, kina bark would have been classified as hot, making it inappropriate for treatment of a hot disease like fever. Fortunately for the Europeans, Crawford notes therapeutic use and success outweighed theoretical incompatibility. Hmm, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. I also just think of it as cold. Like if I had to think of quinine as anything, I would think of it as cold, but that's because I've only had it in cold tonic water. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Maybe that's like how they started tricking their brains was by the 19th century, they started mixing it with, yeah. Yeah. With like what? Yeah. Uh, The bark was globalized by the end of the 17th century and became one of the most valuable and widely used medicaments in the Atlantic because of its recognition as the best treatment for malarial fevers. It was officially introduced into the London Pharmacopoeia in 1677, and by 1681 it was universally accepted as an anti-malarial substance. Stephanie Ganger notes that even as both the bark and the disease were known by many different names across Eurasia, all botanists and medical practitioners agreed that the bark of the Kina Kina tree was the singular treatment for malaria. It was extremely valuable because of both its efficacy and rarity. Ganger describes this ubiquity most eloquently. Bittersweet febrifugal lemonades and bottled wines of the bark sat on the shelves of Lima apothecaries, the counters of Cantonese market stands, and in the medicine chests of Luanda hospital orderlies. They were routinely concocted and administered at the bedsides by Moroccan court physicians, French housewives, and enslaved healers alike, and they accompanied, tucked into their pouches, Dutch sailors to febrile environs, Peruvian soldiers in the battlefield, and North American settlers westward. Scottish physicians, Creole botanists, and French writers alike were unanimous not only in according the bark singularity and the first place among the most effective remedies, but also in holding it to be more generally useful to mankind than any in the Materia Medica. Through the end of the 18th century, I just want to say really quick that that sounds so good to me. <laughs> what, that, bu- that book? Lemony, no, uh, well, uh, uh, no. Just- Fugel? Febri frugal or febri fugal lemonades. That sounds so good. Now it makes me thirsty. What does febri frugal even mean? I have no idea. Febri fugal must mean anti fever lemonade. Oh, like having a the quality or mitigating of curing fever. Yes, indeed. Okay. Look at you with your <laughs> science knowledge. Context words. clues. That's all. Mm. Um, Through the end of the 18th century, it still only grew in the Andean region in New Granada and Peru, and thus remained under the control of the Spanish crown. But the Spanish monopoly and methods of extraction were inefficient and couldn't keep up with the demand. In 1751, the Spanish crown established royal reserves at Loja to supply the royal pharmacy in Madrid with regular annual shipments of Kinabark. Spanish King Ferdinand VI representatives declared the bark, quote, an object worthy of interest, curiosity, and attention. By the time the crown decided to establish their monopoly, though, the bark was already widely commoditized, as suggested by the lateness of the crown's involvement. After all, the bark was a widely known treatment for malaria by the mid-18th century. It was the pre-existing market for cinchona bark that attracted the crown to it. But they came to the cinchona bark game quite late. As Crawford notes, the 18th century presented a range of challenges then that undermined the crown's effort to monopolize the bark. Annual harvesting for the crown took a toll on the kina supply, and the kina kina trees became harder to find in nature. The potency of the bark degraded in the time between harvesting and use. For the long sea voyages across the Atlantic to Spain, it lost its medical efficacy. 
The merchants who transported the bark mixed it with other non cinchona tree bark to inflate their profits and thus defrauded their European customers. The crown depended on indigenous peoples for the knowledge necessary to differentiate the different varieties of cinchona trees as different trees produced different potencies of bark. In typical conquistador form, the Spanish relied on the indigenous medical cosmology even as their missionaries associated the work of the curanderos as idolatry and devil worship and attempted to eradicate indigenous religious beliefs. And significantly, by 1780, the Spanish-owned commercial monopoly and over-harvesting led to the beginning of the slow extinction of the natural cinchona forests. Demand for the bark peaked in the first half of the 18th century, and though the harvesting season was short, summer only, and labor-intensive, the natural supply was mostly able to keep up. After the Spanish crown made its royal order and ramped up harvesting 22 times that of the first quarter of the century, the natural supply was quickly put in danger of complete depletion. After 1717, Cadiz was the only port city granted rights to trade with the Americas by the crown in Spain. Between 1718 and 1728, the annual average of cinchona bark imported at Cadiz was 14,000 pounds. Between 1752 and 58, after the monopoly was established, the annual average of cinchona bark uh, was nearly 318,000 pounds. By the end of the 18th century, the crown had to significantly scale back its harvesting endeavors, in part because of the strain on the local ecology, but mostly because of the impending doom of the Spanish Empire. Bah, bah, bah. By the 19th century, the Spanish Empire was already crumbling. Revolutionaries and smugglers alike took advantage of the turmoil created by Napoleon's invasion of the Iberian Peninsula in 1808. According to Crawford, quote, foreign merchants encouraged bark collectors to trade by claiming that there is no king and there is no Spain, while telling other groups of bark collectors that the crown had opened the harvest of the bark to all those that wanted to extract it, end quote. British travelers like William Stevenson and Clements Markham asserted that the Spanish had harvested the cinchona to near extinction and propped the narrative up as justification for intervention. Historians contend that reports of cinchona extinction were hyperbole. In 1860, the then independent Indian countries exported nearly 2 million pounds of bark, so clearly they had plenty they got to get some bark of. going yeah, on. They got some bark. <laughs> Rather than depletion of the supply, the Indian harvests just sh had to shift to cultivation rather than wild foraging. Up through the late 18th century, the Spanish crown representatives still relied primarily on trees in the wild, which were hard to find without indigenous knowledge, and required bark collectors to wait years between harvests for the bark to grow back lest the tree just die. By the 19th century, that model had shifted to widespread cultivation. Still... Other Europeans, especially the British, Dutch, and French, who relied on quinine for their imperial aspirations, claimed the forests were, were going extinct to justify their smuggling operations. In 1981, historian Daniel Hedrick proposed that quinine was at the core of European 19th century imperialism. He pointed to the failed expeditions into the African interior in the early part of the century and contrast them with the successful ventures in the decades after Britain and the Netherlands established their own cinchona tree supplies in India and Java, respectively. His thesis presupposed that quinine, or the Kina bark precursor, was widely available and widely consumed by the agents of empire. Other historians have since contested this claim, primarily because Hedrick was inferring rather than providing concrete data on the distribution and use of anti-malarial treatments. He offers information about the number of convicts who chose service to the Royal African Corps as an alternative to prison, but not how many of them were issued a supply of quinine to survive the endeavor. For example, two-thirds of Europeans who landed on the Gold Coast in the years 1823-27 to 27 died there. In total, 77% of the white soldiers sent to West Africa died, and 21% were permanently disabled by disease or violence. And though European invaders were susceptible to dysentery, yellow fever, typhoid, and other illnesses, malaria was the principal killer of Europeans in Africa. The deadliest strain of plasmodium, plasmodium falciparum, is endemic in tropical sub-Saharan Africa and killed its victims far more swiftly than those strains common in the Mediterranean. 
That's Doc- crazy. It's like, that can't possibly be worth it. Well, yeah. I, but apparently it was because I just kept on throwing bodies at it. Yeah, I guess it was. Doctors in the early 19th century still practiced bleeding and purging to combat fevers, both of which uh, tended to actually weaken patients, aiding the anemia and organ failure of malaria in particular. But many individuals used quinine, even though it wasn't compatible with humoral theory, before germ theory took root. For example, army physicians Jean-André Antonini and François Clement Maillot rebelled against accepted military medical practices to treat intermittent fevers with quinine. According to Hedrick, though again he doesn't offer a citation to support his claim, by the mid-1840s, Europeans on the Gold Coast, quote, regularly kept a jar of quinine pills at their bedside. He also points to statistics collected by the Royal Navy's African Squadron, which reportedly noted a mortality rate drop from 65 per 1,000 in 1824 to 45 to 22 per 1,000 in 1858 to 67, which Hedrick attributes to shifting medical knowledge and practice and, quote, the prophylactic use of quinine in the British military. Matthew Crawford has shown how in demand quinoa bark was right up through the turn of the 19th century. Supply could barely meet demand. For two centuries, the bark itself remained expensive in Europe, controlled as it was by those with access to South American markets and the Spanish crown's monopoly. Its associations with Catholicism made it suspect among some Protestant communities, and it didn't actually fit into the humoral theory of medicine, but it remained the main treatment for malaria in Europe for over 200 years. In 1820, Pierre-Joseph Pelletier and Joseph B.N.M. Cavantou perfected the process for extracting quinine, the natural alkaline that occurs in quinoa bark in France. They quickly established a factory in Paris for the extraction of quinine, an activity that's often mentioned as the beginning of the modern pharmaceutical industry. Even with the process for extraction perfected, the Dutch, British, and French all still needed to get a supply of bark, which meant that they had to pay the market price. While they could still buy from the Andean colonies, as previously noted, quinoa bark was still a major export for those countries, the Dutch and British preferred to control their own supplies to ensure that they got the best price for the goods. By 1857, the British government in India was paying over 7,000 pounds a year on quinine, an untenable expenditure. To achieve a consistent and inexpensive supply, the Dutch, French, and British had two choices. Produce a scalable synthetic or plant their own supply. Scientists in all the major European empires were encouraged to seek out a synthetic formula. In 1850, the French Society of Pharmacy made a call to the chemists, quote, we make a call offering the amount of 4,000 francs to the discoverer of the way to prepare synthetic quinine, end quote. Participants were notified of the January 1st, 1851 deadline and the requirement of submitting at least half a pound of the synthetic substance. Needless to say, nobody claimed the prize. A working synthetic would not be achieved until 1944. So the only viable option in that intervening century was to establish supplies of the bark within the boundaries of respective empires. The Dutch and British both controlled territories that botanists believed would be favorable to the growth of the cinchona. In 1852, the Dutch government charged Justus Charles Haskarl with collecting cinchona species samples for transplantation to Southeast Asia. British operatives like Richard Spruce, Robert Cross, and Clements Markham similarly slipped into South America in the search for plants, seedlings, and seeds of cinchona. Like the Spanish conquistadors 300 years earlier, the British smugglers relied on indigenous knowledge to find and collect cinchona samples. Clements Markham, an English geographer and explorer, was working as an operative for the India office in 1859. A colleague proposed that the India office send someone to surreptitiously collect samples from Peru that the British might plant their own cinchona groves in India, which had regions that might be amenable to the growth of the finicky trees. Markham volunteered and made his way to Peru, reportedly as a geographer come to map the land. He was on the expedition for nearly two years and wrote up his adventures as soon as he returned for publication. 
though he repeated the story of the Countess of Chinchona as the champion of the bark's arrival in Europe, he did acknowledge his own reliance on indigenous guides, saying, quote, I owe much to the intelligent assistance of our guide Martinez, who, to great experience in woodcraft, added a lynx's eye for a calisaya plant, and it required no little quickness and penetration to distinguish these treasures amidst the close entanglement of the undergrowth in the dense forest. Martinez spoke Spanish very imperfectly, and without a knowledge of Quechua, I should have found much difficulty in conversing with him, but he had a most complete and thorough knowledge of all forest lore, and was acquainted with the native name of almost every plant and with the uses to which they were or might be applied." Quote. When Markham arrived in Lima with his team, which included botanist Richard Spruce and Kew gardener Robert Cross, they encountered a country on the brink of war. Peruvian authorities were heavily invested in protecting their cinchona, which was a major export for the country. In addition to patrolling their borders to defend against Bolivian attacks, they had armed and dangerous soldiers available to defend the Cinchona groves. Of course, in Markham's own account, he does not suggest that there may have been some illegality in his maneuvering through the Peruvian land to collect specimens without explicit permission from the Peruvian government. Despite the dangers, Markham collected seeds and seedlings from all the varieties of cinchona save one and dispatched them to the West Indies and India for attempted cultivation, and within just a few months. Cross and Spruce collected 100,000 cinchona sucurubra uh, seeds and, within, uh, and 637 young plants. 463 seedlings successfully reached India. Their efforts to find samples and then transplant them mostly failed, but the British had some success in Ceylon and India. Within 20 years of the Markham expedition, the Indian groves produced nearly 5,000 tons of bark annually. According to Carl Rostiala, by the 1840s, British citizens and soldiers in India were using 700 tons of cinchona bark annually for their protective doses of quinine. Quinine powder was bitter and slightly lemony generally mixed with water or compacted into pills to swallow whole. British operatives and soldiers in India took to mixing their quinine with sugar and soda water, the first homebrew tonic water. Mm. According to the Erasmus Bond Tonic Company, quote, In 1858, a man called Erasmus Bond patented an improved aerated tonic liquid. He was the very first to combine the quinine with a whole range of other flavoring agents. Tonic was born. End quote. Quinine was repackaged as tonic water across the British Empire in the 1860s, with companies like Schweppes jumping into the market in the 1880s. Agents of the British Empire from Nigeria to India mixed it with a splash of gin to further mask the bitter quinine. And so was the national British cocktail born, a defense against malarial fever consumed in vast boozy quantities for over a century. Winston Churchill is alleged to have said that, quote, the gin and tonic has saved more Englishmen's lives and minds than all the doctors in the empire. <laughs> Agreed. Oh my God, it's making me so thirsty. I mean, not only is it not even 10 a.m., but I'm also seven months pregnant, but I still just really want a gin and tonic. <laughs> Though the British had enough success to establish a ruling colonial elite of white Brits, Scotsmen, Irish, and Welsh in India, it would ultimately be the Dutch who dominated the quinine market from the late 19th century until the invention of the synthetic replacement in 1944. The Dutch had a great deal more success in Java, with seeds purchased from a British trader in Peru. At first, most cinchona operations were privately owned by Dutch farmers and businessmen. European quinine manufacturers relied heavily on the Dutch suppliers, but worked together to drive the price of the bark down, even as they increased the price of the quinine alkaline. By the 1890s, the Dutch government stepped in. In 1893, the Java bark farmers asked the Dutch government to intervene in the artificially low bark prices. At the same time, the Dutch Minister of Colonies, W.K. Baron von Dedham, asked the quinine traders and manufacturers to explain the low price for bark. While he was dissatisfied with their justification, the Dutch maintained a commitment to liberal market policies and refused to intervene directly. Fortunately for the Dutch planters, though, the Dutch government helped keep them afloat while the global market prices drove other planters out of business. And then, 
The Dutch built their own quinine manufacturing plants, the first outside of Europe or South America. By the end of the 19th century, the Dutch became the world's largest supplier of both cinchona bark and quinine. Dutch success proved particularly important to the original European sufferers of malaria, the Italians. For much of the global life of quinine, the Italians had no central government or system to address the widespread issue of malaria, which really plagued the southern Italians the most. The city of Rome and Roman Campania were, for centuries, heavily afflicted by a seasonal manifestation of the parasite. It was so ubiquitous in Rome that malarial fever was also known as the Roman fever. Every summer, the wealthy fled the city for cooler climes. The poor suffered greatly. Well before Italian unification and any thought of a centralized response to malaria, Rome was the malaria capital of the 17th century European world. In the 1860s, Italy unified. With central government came all the challenges of administering a country with different regional problems. Malaria proved a testing ground of sorts for the Italian government. According to Frank Snowden, quote, the full extent of the prevalence of malaria first captured national attention in the decade following 1878, end quote. The very first prime minister of United Italy died of malaria in 1861, just after unification was completed. But knowledge of malaria was still sparse. The parasite that caused malaria wasn't discovered until 1880, when French physician Alphonse Le Verin discovered it in a patient's blood. Malaria had plagued the Italian peninsula, and especially its poor and rural folk, for centuries. But the 1870s, after unification, was the first time any centralized body attempted to assess the damage it caused. Italy's attempt to build a national railroad was, and I apologize immediately, railroaded by malaria. In 1878, 1,455 of the 2,200 railroad workers in Sicily required medical attention for malaria. Government inquiries between 1860 and 80 revealed that Italian farming was far behind American and Russian competitors, that the Italian countryside was squalor, that the Italian peasantry was more sickly than any other European population, all because of malaria. According to Snowden, quote, in 1887, the Italian state launched a second investigation by beginning to collect and publish health statistics. Declaring malaria a reportable disease, the Department of Health produced a statistical profile that illustrated the urgency of taking action. The investigation found that of Italy's 8,362 townships, 3,075 were malarial. The greatest challenge to dealing with malaria was that the zones most susceptible were its most fertile zones, and the fertility was facilitated by the conditions that encouraged malarial transmission. One proposed solution, when the miasma theory still dominated, was to implement widespread drainage. That required massive infrastructural investment, however, and threatened the fertility of Italy's largest grain-producing agricultural model. Members of the anti-malarial crusade that coalesced around the issue tried to implement screen use across the country, but because one or two mosquitoes always got in despite screens, and the screens made them feel like they were in cages, the rural population ripped out the screens, using them as sieves for tomato sauce. <laughs> That's racist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding. Um... Treatment, according to Italian experts, was a more effective approach. So, starting in 1904, the Italian government started purchasing quinine wholesale. According to Snowden, quote, as early as the campaign in 1906, the provincial officer of health reported that the city had organized a service of prophylaxis and care that was above all praise, distributing quinine preventively to 9,415 healthy peasants and treating 2,474 fever patients, end quote. Education, too, became essential to the anti-malarial campaign, as with any public health crisis, and the government integrated anti-malarial measures into the peasant school curriculum. While their parents and grandparents resisted the prophylactic measures like screens and mosquito nets, the education efforts were more effective with raising a new generation of rural folk who understood the disease, its origins, and how to avoid it or treat it. Early 20th century efforts made great strides toward addressing Italy's malarial problem. 
government-provided quinine and treatment stations were essential to that effort, as would be education. Still, southern Italians emigrated by the thousands for less malarial climes, heading to North and South America. In 1914, World War I broke out, and much of the Italian government's anti-malarial efforts were disrupted, but not derailed. The anti-malarial campaign had major long-term implications for Italian life and politics. Its reliance on women as teachers, mothers, and healthcare providers empowered a generation of Italian feminism. Its requirement of a centralized government providing free health care to its citizens shaped the rise of Italian socialism. Anti-malarial campaigners had to advocate for workers' rights, ensuring that laborers had access to enclosed accommodations, for example, and other prophylactic measures to ensure both their ability to continue working and to preserve their individual health. Kina bark and quinine were essential to all of that work and helped to reshape early 20th century Italy in ways that would have permanent effects just as it facilitated the spread of British, Dutch, and French imperialism, propped up early 19th century Andean economies and wars of independence, and created entirely new industries, from the manufacturing of quinine itself on three continents to the invention of the fizzy tonic water that saved as many Brits as it intoxicated. It's even the root of homeopathy, the medical theory that like cures like, And we could talk about this if you'd like, but I ran out of steam when I was writing this copy. (laughs) I think it's interesting the ways that the knowledge and commodities that Europeans appropriated and stole in the so-called age of exploration would go on to reshape their worlds and the ripple effect of a single pebble dropped in the pond. Kinabark is definitely one of those pebbles. It protected indigenous Andeans from being ravaged by yet another European disease, but also allowed the British to better control India and the Belgians to dominate the Congo, and also completely changed the lives of rural Italians for the better. Talk about a globalization story. The end. I got no topics for discussion, so. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I have to say is that um, it's weird uh, that how many similarities are in your the story of quinine and the story of smokeless tobacco. It's really, you'll see what I mean when we read my episode, you'll be like, holy crap, we talk about like half of the same uh, events. Um, so I imagine that that's sort of what like all, all like histories of early modern commodities, it's, it's yeah. all, they're all kind of that story of, of um, indigenous origins and then this massive globalization and then this really complicated um, issue of, um, you know, imperial powers, like, using it against their, um, using it, like, in order to achieve settler colonialism and all that stuff. Like, yeah. it's it seems like it's a story that is repeated often with different uh, substances. Yeah, I, a, a different iteration of my conclusion, I talked more about, like, sugar and coffee and tea and all of these imperial commodities that, or even, even potatoes, like, that have these long-term effects that you know the the pond ripples are that start from this one little plant that you know local indigenous peoples used in different ways chocolate too right that Mm -hmm. and then how that expands to just like completely reshape the world in these weird and seemingly disconnected ways yeah i mean it's the same with tobacco too like it becomes a part of almost everyone in the world's daily life Mm -hmm. um almost everyone in the world becomes addicted to nicotine (laughs) um and it all started with just um indigenous americans and australian aboriginals like you know harvesting this plant for like toothaches and stuff it's really um really an interesting story and a reminder that like globalization has been happening for centuries you know that's modern like 20th centuryists and modern historians are all usually like oh my god the the globalization of the world since world war ii or whatever and it's like no this has been going on for a long time long time yeah yeah um yeah i mean that's all i have to say i and now i want a gin and tonic thanks well, you'll have to wait 17 more months. Um, <laughs> I did want to say that uh, I picked this topic because 
I read Natasha Pulley's Bedlam Stacks um, when it first came out, I think in 2017. And that book, it's obviously like it's historical fiction and it's magical realism too. But it buries this Kina Bark narrative in a world of magical stone guardians and same-sex love. So obviously it was right up my alley. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do do recommend it to anyone who's uh, interested in a more fanciful version of this episode. And it's because of that book that I've been thinking about quinine way more than I would think about anything that is historical that's not my own specific research um or certainly herbal remedies more specifically right. um since that time because I even made I even because of that book I made quinine a unit in my world history class did you actually try tonic water no that's gross but that is my dad's favorite drink as well Gin and tonic? Yep. G and T's. Oh, they're so good. They're just like so refreshing. I don't even like seltzer water. I don't think I would like tonic water. Yeah, I mean it's like has a bitterness, but it's like a it's like a satisfying bitterness like like lemonade ha you know, like mm. lemonade is bitter, but it's like in a good way. <laughs> but isn't lemonade sour? Is that different than bitter? I mean I would say quinine is sour. Hmm. Well, mean, the tonic water now doesn't have quinine in it anymore. It just has like uh, artificial flavorant. Yeah, isn't that weird? Yeah. Like, why um, no, I'm it? not surprised. <laughs> but when I was when I was little, my dad my dad was like a really hardcore alcoholic, and when I was little, um, I got into the tonic water in his fridge, and it definitely had quinine in it because I can remember mm. being like, "What is?" you know, what is quinine or whatever? And my dad would be like, oh, well, it's just like the stuff they used to make tonic water. And I can remember, Mm. and I drank it, and it reminded me of, like, yeah, slightly more bitter sort of lemonade. And my mom was really mad when she found out he let me drink tonic water. I mean, it wasn't alcoholic, obviously. No, it's just quinine. Right, but, like... It's medicinal, if anything. He used it for his G&T, so... Right. My mom was like, that's kind of inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. So I've been I've been a quinine lover for most of my life. Um, yeah, yeah, no, this is a good episode. I like it. Good. We have to say our goodbyes. We mm-hmm. do have to do that. Make sure that you follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can find us. You can join our Facebook group, Dig History Pod Squad, to get backstage access to really weird history memes and They're the, not inner, weird. Workings, the They're inner workings of Marissa's brain. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks for joining us on this little ride around the world with some drugs. Enjoy the series. Thanks. Don't do Bye. drugs, kids. Bye. Except for quinine. You can do that drug. You can do that drug, yeah. Bye. Bye. This podcast was produced by the historians of Dig, Elizabeth Garner Masaryk, Sarah Hanley Cousins, Marissa Rhodes, and me, Avril Earls. Thanks for listening. With companies like Schweppes. Oh, that's not how you spell Schweppes, is it? Though the current arrows may have dabbed in trial, <laughs> dabbed, <laughs> emanated from the Campania and the city's swamps. Can you hear my kids running around? Yep. Oh my god. <laughs> it's so it's so Hang on. I'm just gonna pat his home, so I'm gonna tell him to tell them not to run around. The Credi Corregido? Corregido. Corregido? Corregidor. Corregidor? Corregidor. Though the earliest accounts of the bark, like that of Nicolas Menar, wait, is it? Who is, is he French? Is he, Spanish. No, Spanish. Spanish, okay. So, Menardes. Menardes, okay. Carl, cor- he's an asshole. Yeah, seriously. Where'd you go? Babe, she's she set a timer on these bagels. Okay. Oops. You're actually baking bagels? Bagels. Are you going to boil them and... In uh, baking soda and baking sugar. Soda? Yeah, we already did that part. Oh, cool. Stephanie. Oh my God, Ganger. Sure. Gonger. Oh, Gonger. What does an umlaut mean over an A? I have no idea. Oh.